You have homosexuals. There are homosexuals all over the United States of America. And they are taking over. And you know what? They hate God in the Bible. They were, just, they were disturbing everyone because they were doing what Christians are supposed to do. We are to be a really a disturbing essence in, to the people around us. Esta proclama es patria o muerte. Romans 13. Let's get a sense of it. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there, there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. If you will, open your Bible to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 is the most formidable New Testament chapter summing up the believer's responsibility to the government. What do you think, silly dog? You love America? Silly dog's a dog of little words, but seeing as he's a chihuahua, that's a salchicha and a chihuahua mixed together, he probably doesn't care for America too much. And I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. Hello, this is Michael Beverly. Welcome to my channel. This video is about Romans 13 and the problem it presents for Christians. Now, don't for a second think that because I'm juxtaposing different politicians that I'm giving an opinion. My show is not about politics. This, this video is not about politics, except how it relates to Roman 13s and the problem that that creates for Christians. So if you see me showing clips of evil dictators and then American presidents, I'm not equating anybody here. What I'm pointing out is that Romans 13 equates these people. Romans 13 declares there ain't nobody in power that God didn't put in power. And to me, that creates a real problem for Christianity. I served with him as governor in the late 70s. He asked me to support him for president once. Did you? Of course not. These Christians don't do Jesus' work, which is to feed the poor and take care of the ones who can't help themselves. That's what their Jesus said. Feed those who have no way. To take ones who have to have nothing to going for them. Help them in my name. Oh. So comedian George Carlin, who also was very good at social commentary, makes a point here that comes up quite a lot during election time. It's like, if you believe in helping the poor and the needy and the foreigners, how can you vote conservative? And then on the conservative side, of course, they say, well, no, I want to be able to do this voluntarily and not be forced and maybe give it the way that I want to give it, give my charity. So there's always this fight over who has the gun, who's controlling the government. The Bible makes certain claims. Okay, let's just read, uh, let's just read verse three from, again, I'm in, I'm in Romans 13, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority, then do what is right and you will be commended. Now, if the Bible's inspired by God and the Bible's true, then it would make sense we should be able to trust this first. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right. Now, if if burning children alive, like if that if if that's not wrong, I'm, I'm not sure what is wrong. So in this in this this next clip's from comedian and satirist Bill Hicks, who unfortunately died way too early. And just, just, just take this neck, these next couple clips to their logical conclusion. If you're a Christian and you believe that doing right means you shouldn't fear your own government, what would you say to one of these children that's about to be burnt alive by their own government. Well, if that's true. How come we don't see Bradley tanks knocking down Catholic churches? You know, I mean, if in fact child abuse is your concern. Winds fan the flames and reduce the entire property to ash within an hour. Around 80 Branch Davidians died, including David Koresh and 25 children. Did you watch the conventions, Republican convention, uh, Democratic convention? No. 
I think if you watch those, you're an idiot. Now, you can disagree with Bill Burr here and think that it's important that you pay attention to all the issues and vote. I'm not going to argue with you about that. Personally, I moved to Mexico, try to avoid American news as much as possible. And all I can tell you from personal experience, I know this is anecdotal, never been happier in my life. What essentially sets a nation state apart, which is the monopoly on, on violence. Okay, what President Obama was saying there is that the idea, the very idea of a government is that it has the monopoly on the initiation of force and violence. And if it doesn't have that, it's not a true government. And an example would be when the, assuming the story is true, which I don't think it is, but let's just assume the story is true. Jesus is tried by the Sanhedrin and the Jewish leaders and they, you know, they pronounce the death sentence on him for blasphemy, et cetera, et cetera. But what do they do? Well, they don't kill him because they don't have the authority. They have to go to the Romans. So if you don't, if, if, a, if, a, if a body of people or a group of people in a, in a geopolitical area, like a, like a certain geography, if, if they don't have the monopoly on the use of force, then they're not a government. They 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 must have this to 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 le, to legitimize their ability to enforce the laws and the regulations, etc. So the problem for Christians becomes, and as we'll see in some of the coming up clips, is that God apparently in Romans thirteen through the writing of Paul tells Christians. You guys need to obey the ruling government because it's been put in place specifically by God. In other words, it doesn't matter if it's Stalin, Lenin, Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot, Pinochet. It doesn't matter. God put that person in power. And if... if an American president wins an election, it's because Jesus ordained it. When, when there used to be kings, it was because God wanted that king in power. Now think about the ramifications of that and think about the conundrums it puts Christians in. Now, of course, we know Christian apologists they always have excuses. <laughs> Ich bin aus euch selbst herausgewachsen, bin eins selbst unter euch gestanden, bin in viereinhalb Jahren Krieg wieder mitten unter euch gewesen und habe mich dann durch Fleiß, durch Lernen und ich kann sagen durch Hungern langsam emporgearbeitet. I would like you to participate in a little thought experiment. It's the late 1930s, Germany. The population is roughly broken down 60-40 Protestant versus Catholic. Of course, there's a small percentage of Orthodox Christians. There's probably a few communist atheists. And of course, we know there's a small percentage of the population that is Jewish. The 60% majority are mostly Lutherans. Imagine you're a Lutheran. You've gone to church. You believe in Jesus, you believe in the basic doctrines because you're, you're a teenager and you're growing up in an environment that's been affected by the war. This charismatic leader gives speeches like the one we just heard. I was one of you. I worked myself up from the pits of despair. I learned, I persevered. And, and he goes on to talk about how he's going to make Germany great again. Love the fatherland. Love the motherland. Love the country. This cry is heard everywhere from Russia to Cuba, as we heard in the quote earlier. Patria o muerte. Motherland or death. Tell me if you're willing to put yourself in the place of a 17 or 18-year-old teenage boy, strong, 
blue-eyed, blonde hair, proud of his country, a believer in Jesus. And war, the war bells are ringing. And what are you told? Well, of course you're told that authentic and real Christians and Germans, people who are loyal to their parents, people who are loyal to their country, of course they would be 100% for the war effort that's coming because Germany must be proud and Germany must not let these prior insults go unanswered. Tell me if you're honest that you would buck that, that you would know that this was leading down a terrible path and that some of the worst atrocities in history would be committed. Of course not. Of course you wouldn't be thinking that. Even if you're in your 20s or 30s and you have a reasonable grasp of reality and a university degree, you're not likely to imagine the coming horrific, hellish things that your country is going to do. As you get sucked into this, where's the point, if you're a good Christian, where you say, stop, no more. I know Romans 13 tells me that I must submit to the government, but I also know that at some point I, the government's asking me to do things I shouldn't do. Where's that line? We know from history very few People were like, say, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who ended up eventually being imprisoned and, and martyred for his faith. How many, unless, if you're an American Christian, I'm sure it would be easy for you to say, well, none of those Germans were real Christians, especially the Catholics. They didn't have the Holy Spirit, now did they? I don't think that it's fair and keep in mind, I'm a Jew by birthright, and in no way I am excusing any atrocities of war by Germany or America or China or Russia or Japan or any country. I find war disgusting. I find the idea of killing another human being, no matter what our differences are, absolutely unthinkable. Now, yes. I do believe human beings have a right to self-defense, and this is where it gets very tricky if you're a Christian. At what point, if you believe that eternity will be spent in heaven, at what point do you pull the trigger and kill a non-believer knowing that if you die, you'll go to heaven, but if you kill this person, they will spend eternity in hell? Where do you get this objective morality that you claim you have from? What, do you look this up in the Bible? Does God reveal it to you in the heat of the moment? I had a talk with my son once who was on a truck in Iraq behind a 50 caliber machine gun and he was moments away from lighting up a family of Iraqis. I can only be grateful for whatever God may exist or whatever fate may exist that my son did not pull the trigger. He did not have to pull the trigger because his rules of engagement were not crossed. The, the potential enemy turned away and he did not have to pull the trigger. But we know from history that many young men in wars did have to pull the trigger. Many young men did have to kill, and they often killed families, women and children, and defenseless civilians, because that's part of war. Perhaps not on purpose, perhaps not because they wanted to, Ask yourself why PTSD, the rates of veteran suicide and so forth are so horrifically high after a war. The idea in Romans 13 to me is disgusting and abhorrent. The idea that I would secede my will and my thinking ability 
to a government because God said to do that. Because he put them in place. It's ridiculous to me. And, it, and following that, whether it's through Christianity or through or even through atheism in, in communist regimes where the leaders were like gods, practically. To come back from that is something that I'm grateful that I never had to do. When I was a child, my mom would tell me later, when I was a child, she worried that I would be going off to Vietnam. Thankfully, that war ended before I hit the age that I would have been potentially drafted. How many young Americans died in Vietnam because they were good Christians just following orders? Orders from their government and orders from their God. And how many young Vietnamese men, women, and children, and I can answer this question as being at least a million plus, how many died because people at the top of governments decided it was a good idea to use violence and destruction to solve a conflict over territory and power and oil and the rights of this group or that group? There is absolutely no doubt that Martin Luther, who started Protestantism, was an anti-Semite. Just read some of the quotes of the things he said. The Catholics and the Christians in Germany were faced with this idea of religious and racial hatred. But like in America today, there was a support for this hatred of the other. Well, the Jews, they were the Christ killers. And the communists and the progressives, the atheists, they were a threat to the blessing of the nation. They were a threat to God's order. Just like in America today, when you listen to a preacher preach against homosexuals and feminists and progressives, the, the words are maybe changed just a little bit from Hitler's speeches, but they're, they're essentially the same message. The other guy is not quite human. They don't quite deserve the same rights as I do because I'm a Christian. I follow the law and I obey God. And it isn't loving of me to extend the kind of grace this progressive, atheist, feminist, homosexual, deviant, blah, blah, blah. If I extend, if I extend to them the rights they're demanding for, it'll destroy the nation. It'll destroy the country. There's, there's little difference in this when it comes to hating other people. Just plug in different names and different ideologies. It still comes down to the same thing. Hatred. And when you look at Romans 13 and you say to yourself, I need to obey and submit to my government. And the government is preparing for war, going to war, 
or in other ways diminishing the humanity of another people group, when do you stop yourself and say, wait a minute, I can't participate in this? And how do you even extricate yourself from it? I maintain that Romans 13 is a terrible doctrine that only an evil, malicious, and cruel God would impose upon humanity. And those that preach Romans 13 should be followed are essentially saying they don't mind if the government takes the people down the path to genocide and war. Because once you pass the tipping point, you can't stop it. Go back to the thought experiment. You're this 22, 23-year-old young man in the military now who at 16 and 17 was just a good German. And you hadn't done anything wrong. You were going to your Lutheran church or your Catholic church. Maybe you were confirmed and you take the communion and you love Jesus. And you're doing your duty to God and country. And all of a sudden you find yourself killing Americans who just happen to also be Christians. Now we know from history that some people had a problem with this, but most people went along and just followed orders. Why? Because but it's human nature. We're tribal pack animals if we allow ourselves to follow these types of rules. It's, we're one step away from being on the outside of the concentration camp. And if you think you're so special that you would never do those things, that you, that you, you possess some part of you that is, that's so good and pure because Jesus has cleansed you, what are you actually saying about all the Christians in the past centuries that went to war and crusades, that owned slaves, that killed in the name of God? Are you saying none of them have the Holy Spirit? None of them had the, the clarity and intelligence that you have, that you have it today, and they didn't have it back then. Be honest with yourself. Lie to me. I don't care. Lie to your friends and neighbors. When you go to bed at night, don't lie to yourself. Be honest. This Teaching in Romans 13 cannot be from God unless God is evil. They seem to forget a little bit about what the Jews, Jordan! specifically not only the leadership, but everyone else, Jordan! seem to be saying Jordan! in the crowd as they yelled to Pilate. Let me remind you. Jordan! Because notice again what he said. You intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Let's go back to the historical account. Matthew 27, 25. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us Jordan! and on our children. What were they saying? Crucifying. Let His blood be upon us. And now all of a sudden they're saying, Hey, you're trying to bring this guy's blood upon us. The facts are pretty disturbing to them. Guys, even today people love to try to rewrite and misremember history just like the Jews. Just like the Jews, just like the Jews, just like the Jews. This is a universal chapter as to its application. Whatever kind of government, whatever era, whatever century, whatever circumstances, the general principles that we see here about our conduct apply. Whatever kind of government, Whatever era, whatever century, whatever circumstances, the general principles that we see here about our conduct apply whatever circumstances. The general principles that we see here about our conduct apply whatever circumstances, whatever circumstances, whatever circumstances. 
whatever circumstances, whatever circumstances, whatever circumstances, whatever circumstances. And this, of course, is the supernatural wonder of Scripture that 2,000 years after it is written, it speaks specifically and applicably to the times in which we live. It's hard to know if John MacArthur is actually this dishonest about the Scripture or that he's so blinded himself that he can't see the ridiculousness of what he just said. The Scripture, the command to obey the government was, is timely today as it was 200 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago. Is he, is he just, is he crazy? Now, we, we know for a fact that American Christians, in, both in the North and the South, held slaves to, based on biblical teaching. This is an axiomatic fact. There is no disputing it. Now, when the American Civil War happened, everybody likes to talk about how the, the South, you know, the South had slaves and the North were the good guys, but the, the Nor there were northern states that still had slavery and through the whole war. This is like a, a, a weird faded part of people's memory that, that there were slave states in the North. And it was justified through Christianity. The Bible teaches that, you know, slaves obey your masters and follow the government. If, if you were part of a group that was helping slaves escape, if you're a Christian in the antebellum South and you help a slave run away, you were violating the law of the land and you were also violating Romans 13 and you're violating what John MacArthur just said a good Christian would do. That's follow the law. Now, now wait a minute, you're going to say, no, 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 because slavery is bad. No, the Bible does not outlaw slavery. The, the Bible was used to justify and the, and the slaves were held in the American colonies and in the antebellum South based on biblical law. So you can't possibly say that violating the government and, re, and helping a, a runaway slave get away it was a Christian duty. No, the, the opposite would be true. The, your Christian duty would be to capture the slave and turn the slave back to its master. Even Paul, when he sent back, when he writes the letter to Philemon and he sends back the slave, he's following the law of the land and he's telling the slave and he's telling the master, you know, like you guys should make up because you're Christians. This doctrine that the government is an authority put in place by God and that you should obey it is, it's just so twisted, I was about to call it demonic. Again, if, if a God is behind Romans 13, this God is wicked. As, as, a, as a wicked of a God as you could possibly imagine. A lot of people have questions about Romans 13 verses 1 to 7, which tells Christians to submit. Well, yeah, because it's confusing if you're trying to follow this and all it does is kick the can down the road. Because you can say, oh, it's very clear. Follow the government. Oh, but as long as it's not saying to violate God's laws or to prohibit you from doing something God commands you to do. But what are those things? You don't know. I mean, yeah, you can say, you can say murder's wrong, but... Is killing another human being wrong? Obviously, Christians throughout history have not agreed on what the legal definition from God's perspective of murder is because Christians have justified war since the dawn of time and also self-defense. When, when does self-defense cross over to murder, to an unlawful act that Jesus would be sad about? Can you, can you tell me? No, of course you can't. It's impossible. Now, it's easy to say... It's easy to say theft is wrong, 
But what if you're part of a majority that votes an extremely high tax rate to take money from another group that you don't like? Like, oh, say the Jews. Would that be wrong? Or does majority just automatically align with God's will? There are so, we could spend an eternity talking about trolley problems and what ifs. And I don't need to go down the, every one of those paths to make the point very obviously clear. You can't follow Romans 13 without then having a million questions about what does God require in terms of disobeying the government? Like how far does the government have to go before you're called to disobey it? And in, in, and in what ways can you disobey it? And in what ways are you commanded to follow it when there's all these gray areas, which is like everything? It's really strange to me because if you're a Christian, let's say you're a Christian in California, 20 years ago it would be very clear. You can't smoke weed. Like that's a sin. Is it a sin today? Well, I mean, the government has legalized it for recreational use. Christian leaders, some of them say, look, what's the difference between this and drinking a glass of wine? Now, other Christians will say, well, it's obvious you shouldn't smoke weed for reason, 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 even though the state has authorized it. Or you could even argue that the federal government hasn't decriminalized marijuana use. And so as the overarching authority over your life that to be a good Christian, even in California or Oregon or other states that have legalized marijuana use, you still can't use it because the federal government says no. You see how these arguments could be endless. You know, and you could never know the truth unless you want to claim that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and given you a truth. But everybody, everybody has their own Holy Spirit now, don't they? You see how this game's played? And the reason it's the reason this is a good example from Romans 13 is you can carry this to every other doctrine or every other teaching in all of Christendom. It's the same thing. You don't know. You're guessing. You're using your own social constructs to decide what the Bible actually says. And then you're standing in confidence that you know you and your church have got it right. Those other guys, they're dummies. They're reading the Bible wrong. They don't have the real Holy Spirit, etc. Do you see how much terrible stuff happens in the name of following God in Romans 13 when your government starts asking you to do things that at first don't quite seem icky and by the time they feel icky, you have already gassed a few million people, or bombed a few million people, or dropped napalm on little Vietnamese girls. To uh, the governing authorities, and that God has put the governing authorities in place to basically to keep order in the world and uh, to keep evil at bay and to... If the Christian God is responsible for keeping order and keeping evil at bay in the world through government, I rest my case. If you're a Christian, you're a fool if you believe this is true, that the governments have kept order and peace and have, and have made the world safe for little boys and girls. Are you kidding me? This is your God. Your God is the one that put these governments in place to protect people so that those that live good, righteous life shouldn't fear. Are you kidding me? Can you say this with a straight face? Looking back over the last 2,000 years of history on this planet, can you honestly say that a good, loving God is the reason each one of these governments in human history was installed and put into place? That's, this was God's plan? Uh, to reward those who do what is good. Now, we all know, and Paul certainly knew, that not all governments are good. 
Uh, in fact, there are many governments in the world today that are, that are quite bad. And so the question down through Christian history for Christians who consider Scripture to be authoritative, and I certainly do, is how can I obey this particular passage, Romans 13, 1 to 7, and yet also obey the many, many parts of Scripture that talk about not oppressing the poor, that talk about reaching out to the disenfranchised and the marginalized, to welcoming and showing hospitality to the stranger, uh, how can I obey uh, all the many passages of Scripture that speak of extending love and kindness uh, to others, especially those who are not like me, when my government may be putting laws into place that are saying I should not show that love and kindness to people? Well, I gotta say this last pastor, he sure shows a lot of signs of the joy of the Spirit. <laughs> How do you know if God wants you to do something? And how do you follow Romans 13 when it seems like not even in Paul's day, he knew some of the governments were bad? Jesus. If you all need me to come preach for you, I can do it. I don't think I could stomach it, but I could do it. Now, listen. Here's this guy's problem, because he's asking good, legitimate questions. How can a Christian know, how, how can a Christian know how to follow the government, what it's doing, you know, if it's, if it's doing bad stuff or good stuff? Like, how do you know? Like, that's the question. That's the question I'm asking. Now, if you take this to its logical conclusion, you'll just walk out of the church, you'll quit tithing, you quit giving money to these big corporate pastors, and you'll just do good stuff. Like, if everybody just did good stuff, like, the world would improve so massively. We, we, we would just have so many, I mean, we wouldn't be perfect, but just stop. Stop giving money to charlatans and liars. None of this stuff's true. Come on. Now, if you're a Christian, you say, no, 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 I'm a Christian, and I just, and I really want to know the answer to the question. Well, here's the answer. You need a guy with a whiteboard. And he going to explain it to you. Okay, folks, it's really, real, real easy. Well, see, you got God, he's perfect, and then you got Jesus, and he's perfect, and then you got humans that are really sucky, and God put these people in over here in powerful governments in order to make sure that this, and the people follow this, and then when you got, you got homosexuals trying to take over, oh, it makes me so mad, those gays. Then, and then you got gay Nazis, and you got gay Islamo terrorists, and you got feminist, atheist, progressive, Islamic terrorists, terrorist, gay, Nazi, transgender um, people that just want to destroy America. And you and we gotta stop it. We gotta stop it, and then everything will be okay. Jesus loves you. So we have a principle. You obey the government and do what they say unless they tell you to do something that's against God in the Bible. And if you're ever told to do something that's against God in the Bible, you have to make a choice. Do I do evil or do I do good? So you've got Islamic terrorists in America. Islamic terrorists. They're a threat to America. But for you to speak up against them is almost against the law. So what will you do? Well, I've got to preach the truth. And the, pre the truth warns me to stay away from people that want to hurt me. You have homosexuals. There are homosexuals all over the United States of America. And they are taking over. And you know what? They hate God in the Bible. So when these groups that want to threaten Christians are in positions of authority, where does that leave us as Christians? Are we supposed to bow down and kiss the feet of such people? What does the Bible say? You see, we got a problem. What happens when the powers that be are evil? Soon enough, the concentration camps were given the authority to forcibly castrate prisoners. Some of those arrested would end up within the criminal prisons, but some, the ones deemed to be repeat offenders, would end up 
in the country's growing concentration camp network. Such prisoners were sent under the typical Nazi euphemistic term of protective custody. Within these camps, prisoners were labelled, made to wear some form of insignia to allow the guards to better understand the crimes of the prisoner. For Jews, it would be the infamous Yellow Star of David. For communists and political prisoners, it was the Red Triangle. And for homosexuals, it was the Pink Triangle. They singled out gay men as the lowest rank of prisoner within the camp. You have homosexuals. There are homosexuals all over the United States of America. But there was such an anticipation and excitement that Jesus was going to return. I mean, people thought, like, he's coming next week. So that excitement for the return of the Lord um, became, in some cases, irresponsibility. It is so refreshing to hear a Christian pastor actually say something that's true and also proves Christianity isn't true, although he doesn't see it that way. But just take it to its logical conclusion. The early Christians thought Jesus was coming back right away. Therefore, none of this stuff mattered. If you read Romans 13 in the light of that, in the light of the fact that Paul thought Jesus was coming back right away, then you could read Romans 13 as follows. Hey guys, Jesus is coming back any day now, very soon, so submit to the Roman authorities, because dudes, there's just no point in trying to buck these big powers and these authorities, because what would be the point? Jesus is coming back to establish his kingdom, and all's going to be good. But if you realize that Paul was wrong and the early Christians were wrong and either Jesus was wrong or Jesus was misquoted, then applying Romans 13 today is idiocy and only an idiot who, who wanted bad things to happen would follow Romans 13 today. Because it only makes sense if you recognize that Paul thought Jesus was returning right away, so it just didn't matter. Nobody needed to bother with trying to change the government because Jesus was coming back soon to take care of that problem. I even had a friend come to me and say, why are you bother, Why do you bother going to college? I announced, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm accepted at UCLA, I'm going to go through a program. And the guy said, why would you ever go to college? Don't you know Jesus will return before you graduate? Yeah, believing this kind of stuff turns you into a moron. So, of course, Christians throughout all of history have had groups saying Jesus is coming back right away again. So none of this stuff matters. You don't need a college degree. You don't need to do this. You don't, you don't need to worry. And, of course, all that leads to bad things happening, at least for the people involved. Grow up. Jesus is not returning because the whole thing is a myth. Sorry, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but if you're waiting for Jesus to come back, you might as well be waiting for the sky to rain M&Ms and Skittles and a friendly unicorn to show up and poop chocolate for you. That, that would be actually more realistic. Oh, we've got chocolate-covered candies. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Uh-oh, now he's getting personal. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Near the bridge, the men of B Battery, 320th Artillery, prepare for another firing mission. Throughout the morning, they have rained howitzer shells upon the enemy forces attacking the camp. Now, with fresh supplies of ammunition, they're ready to begin again. 
just take that last scripture reading in juxtaposition with these military marches and these military campaigns and take it to its logical conclusion. And if you have any ounce of integrity, you will leave Christianity. There's, there's no possible way you can absorb Romans 13 and absorb a loving God that commands people to follow their governments and, and look at history and then say, yeah, this, this Jesus God guy is good and we should follow him. It's idiocy. It's destructive. It's led to so much horrific, disastrous, terrible things in history. Now, you might say, well, does that mean that I'm preaching rebellion and anarchy or overthrow the government? Or let me, I'm going to let Bill Hicks sp speak for me. I, I'm not into uh, political. I'm not into political commentary at all. Yeah. So in that regard, no, because I don't believe giving these people any credence whatsoever, because it's all undeserved. Yeah. Are we not people, individuals, and who is our leader? There is no leader. Shut up. Let's move on to another realm, and that's where I come from. And it and it seems rather anarchistic or a, <clears throat> or a re re revolutionary, or rebellious, like you're saying. This attitude. How oh, God is he a leftist? No. I'm a shockingly unbelievable. I'm me. Yeah. So remove all your little preconceived notions, please. Yeah, I'm just me. I look around the world and I say, if 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 everybody just kind of lived the way that I live my life, the world would be pretty peaceful and like pretty nice. Now, like I'm not saying I'm so great and I never hurt anybody or I don't, you know, I don't do things that I that I probably shouldn't do, etc. But I don't know, guys. Like, I just kind of want to live my life, hang out with my girlfriend, have a few nice meals, live peacefully. When, when you're instructed that your government is instituted by a God that commands you to follow it, I don't see how that leads to anything other than malfeasance and destruction. Now, maybe not tomorrow and maybe not in 10 years, but eventually, it seems to me, world history always leads to the same place. Now, let's, let's repeat. Let's, let's go back over and look of what the actual problem is. Because Christian, when I listen to these Christian apologists, they keep coming back to the same thing. We're to submit to the authority that God put in place and... You know, let's be honest, the, the people that I'm listening to on YouTube tend to be American evangelicals. Then the message would probably be a little bit different if they were in a different country, right? But let's just play pretend for a while that, that that's it's just the American perspective is the one that matters. And what they say is, well, we, we're, we're supposed to submit to God un, unless he tells us to do a sin or he or unless the government tries to, t to stop us from doing something that we're commanded to do. Yeah, this is like, you should obey the government unless it does something that if you had a complete and total understanding of the entire Bible and the mind of God, you would be able, you would be able to resist or go along with. You see how stupid this is? Our general posture toward the government is submission. That is how I feel when I'm dehumanized. It's not embarrassing. It's not humiliating. It's not something that feels wrong or dirty or shameful. It feels like I am the closest to what I am supposed to be and what my role in life is when I am being dehumanized because it's so simplified and it's also somehow very important to my Dom and to myself that I am just being that one thing in that moment that is not particularly human. And that is what I enjoy also about pet play is in that moment, I am not human. I am a pet and it is fun and it is lighthearted and it can also be 
pain focused and it can also be dark um, but generally speaking with pet play it's it's being dehumanized but it is a dehumanization that is very lighthearted and is very much focused on on me just being that one thing in that moment and then having fun and and letting go and being able to shut off my human brain for a while now i include that last clip because evie is talking about how she submits to her dom for a form of escape that helps her um but she describes it as pleasurable and and it makes her happy and it's a for, it's a form of not, it's a little bit difficult to explain. When she talks about being dehumanized, the, the instant reaction we have is, oh, that's a terrible thing. But she's not talking about, at least my impression, she's not talking about being dehumanized in a way that's bad or negative or takes is taking away her, um, it's like, it's not taking away her will. She's not being forced to do things against her will because she's submitted. She 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 does this, it's it's sexual play, yes, but it's not just about sex. It's about how how she describes giving herself over to her dom so she can escape from her mind and not have to be human in that moment or in that time. And while I don't have experience in that, I can I can understand what she's talking about in by my experience in doing other things that help me escape. Now I'm not too much into video games. But I have played them, so I know that this is this is probably an analogy a lot of people would understand. But you play a video game in your mind during that time is taken away from being, you're not thinking about your bills or your life or your problems. You're in the world of the game. Uh, for me, the, the, the closest I could talk about would be uh, sexual play uh, using psychedelics where for some time, maybe an hour, a couple hours, um, my mind is completely out of this world. Like I'm, I'm not myself in that there's nothing in my mind about, about problems or paying rent or bills or having to deal with work. It's like, you're in this, you're in this moment of pure pleasure. You're experiencing the tactile sensations of somebody's body and how you feel and the pleasure. I can tell you like the most insane climatic orgasmic pleasure like off this off this world that I've ever had is is from being on MDMA MDMA and engaging in um, the sexual play because part of the reason is because the the effect of psych, psycho, psychedelics like LSD and mushrooms and, and MDMA uh, inhibit climax. So you actually can have a sexual experience sometimes for a couple hours and it's just mind blowing. Now you can't do this all the time. And I'm, of course I'm not advocating anybody do any drugs. I'm just explaining my experience. You, you can't do this too often because it screws up your, your brain chemistry, at least with MDMA. I think there's, there's research on how often you should do it or if you should ever do it. That's a different story. I know, I know with, um, with mushrooms and acid, it's different than MDMA, but you know, if, if you're going to consider these things, do your own research, you know, talk to the talk, talk to people that know about it and make wise just choices. But back to what, what EB is, was saying in this clip about her play her going out of her mind. This type of submission is therapeutic. Uh, it brings pleasure. It's fun. Um, it can it can help you realize who you are or see things about yourself that maybe you wouldn't have reflected on. I know this is the case with mushrooms. You can and, and as well as acid, you can sometimes think about things and go, "Wow!" So the submission there is different from what Todd just mentioned in that last clip about submitting to the government under Romans 13, because that's a total submission, even against your will or doing things or being kept from do, doing things that you would, that you would like to do or that you would think are good for you. So when you're operating in a world where self-care is important to you, which I highly recommend, take care of yourself, then 
just blanket submitting to the government is like one of the worst possible choices you can make if you care about yourself and, and your loved ones. I'm not saying that means be an anarchist rebel who's breaking the law. That's not the point. The point is that when you give over, when you give over your, your personhood and your will to, to submit to a governing authority, and again, I'm not talking about driving the speed limit or, and you know, not robbing banks. If, you, if that's what you're thinking, you're missing the entire point of what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that at the end of the day, you have to be responsible for yourself. And you have to be responsible to make choices for yourself. And if you give that authority over to, quote, God, the church, and the government, you're giving it over actually to other people who don't have your best interest or your self-interest in mind. Now, what does that lead to? Well, it leads to a lot of abuse and a lot of terrible things happening. Everywhere from spending... 12 years in mind-numbing public schools where you're not taught to think, you're taught to behave and be an obedient worker, all the way up to being sent off to Iraq or Vietnam to kill people for power structures. And those kind of things are destructive to you, they're destructive to humanity, they're destructive, obviously, to the people that end up dead. And, and that scale, like I realize that's a big scale from kindergarten to going off to war. But the idea here is if you give over your autonomy to the government because Romans 13 tells you that God put them in place and God's essentially ordering you to follow them, this, this is an unhealthy submission. It's an unhealthy way to live. Because you need to think for yourself. So now going back to Evie's talk about her submission to her dom. Now keep in mind, this is a very controlled, it's a very controlled situation that she's chosen. And it's, and it, and this is done under very strict rules. Like she's, she's, her, her dom doesn't have the power to throw her into prison for life or to send her off to war in another country or et cetera, et cetera. The, her dom has been given a, a power over her, but she has given it freely and there are certain rules and, and this, if done correctly, now obviously anything can be done incorrectly and, and lead to abuse, but done correctly, these types of relationships can be therapeutic and be part of self-care. And, you know, everybody has different tastes. I, I just want to make it really clear. I, I didn't put this clip in here in any way to demean or judge this woman. I think what she's doing for her is it obviously sounds like that's what's good for her. And I applaud that. And I highly, highly suggest you do the same. Find what is good for you in terms of self-care. Now, the caveat here is don't coerce others. It's always a, there's always needs to be consent and, you know, obviously, but the problem with the problem, obviously with Romans 13 and following these guidelines of Romans 13 is you are now compelled to do things or be subject to things against your consent. And that's where the problem is. And that is where, if you believe that God the God-inspired Romans 13, and it's for all time, not just for the early Christians, you know, in Paul's churches who were looking at an oppressive Roman government and saying, what should we do? And Paul's saying, hey, Jesus is coming back anytime. Don't worry about the government. If you apply that to, to today, it's going to lead to nothing but bad things. Don't do it. Unless they command us to sin or forbid us to do that which is commanded. And there's the rub, isn't it? What exactly does the Bible command you to do specifically or not do? Nobody can agree on these things. And the specifics are very, very difficult to come into, into to be coalesced into some sort of doctrine that can, that can be outlined in a, in a way that you could know. So it's real easy, of course, to say, well, you know, drive the speed limit, although, of course, most Christians, I imagine, that commute to work on freeways don't follow the speed limit because 
they'll say, well, it's like, it's kind of like the pirate code. It's, it's a guideline. So most Christians, if they're going, say, 75 in a 65 zone with the flow of traffic, wouldn't think they were doing something sinful. But, and that's a, that may be a silly example, but it makes the point I'm trying to make. How do you know, how do you know where the line is? How do you know you don't? So this whole thing of, we'll follow, follow the government unless it tells you to sin or unless it stops you from doing what God commands you, like say, go to church during COVID in, in big groups. So then, well, then you're supposed to break the rules. This, this, this takes you down a very slippery slope. And at the end of the day, it just means everybody makes up their own rules. I'm not. This is a Wretched Radio. If in your thinking frail, you're not going to talk about Romans 13, 1 through 7, and the Christian posture towards submitting to the government, are you? No, I'm not. But Dr. R.C. Sproul is. The operative principle in the New Testament for the Christian is obeying the civil magistrate. Not because we are trying to exalt the human authorities, but we recognize that behind those authorities stands the authority of Christ and the authority of God. Dr. R.C. Sproul, decades ago, unpacking Romans 13, giving us the general principles to guide us through figuring out how does the Christian respond to a government that is increasingly seeking to inject itself into church life, and into family life. Suddenly, our realms of authority are getting challenged, and we need to sort this out thoughtfully and carefully. And so I sort of love in a bizarre, ironic way how Christians always think that they're in some unique situation. Like, oh my God, the government's now doing... Oh, it's so terrible. Like, oh my gosh. I mean, come on. If... Do you think that you're challenged more as an American Christian to know how to follow God than a faithful Lutheran was in 1930 Germany or 1940 Germany or 1941 Germany, etc.? Like, like you've got the problem here in America. You have homosexuals. There are homosexuals all over the United States of America. Of what? of how to follow Jesus because the government is so oppressive. Are you freaking kidding me? I wish just once we could have a a time machine and take some of these idiot apologists who just say nonsense back in a time machine to America, you know, saying, saying, oh, 1790 or 1810 and and what and see if the christians of that day of the late uh, 18th century or or the early 19th century or even even 1950 let's be honest would would christians in that era even recognize any one of these Christian pastors are all apologists from today as a Christian. Like if you took one of these guys back there with their books and, and their recordings and you explain to Christians back in some day, whether a hundred years or 200 or 400 and in a language in terms they understood. And you said, this guy believes this stuff. They would think he's a heretic or insane or both. They wouldn't recognize him as a Christian. Are you kidding me? Come now. Can we reason together like mature thinking adults? This whole doctrine of Romans 13 is insanity. Just just read and meditate on the first half of Romans 13 and then study a little bit of history and come to the logical conclusion. I'll leave this to your own thinking. I trust you. Now, how in the world could God be related to a godless government? How can God ordain 
an ungodly political institution. That's what has been so troublesome to people who, who wrestle with the responsibility that the, that the church has with respect to matters of civil obedience. Because this passage, incidentally, is not an isolated one in the New Testament. Again and again, we are told to honor the king, to subject ourselves to the magistrates. And St. Peter tells us that we are to submit ourselves to the civil magistrates that Christ might be honored that Christ might be on it. Well, there are two things that we need to understand here, and that is, in the first place, the concept, biblically, of all earthly government is, in a sense, hierarchical. That all human authority, from the dog catcher up to the governor and to the senator and to the prince or to the king or to the president, whatever, all comes under the authority of God and of His Christ. That should cause us to have a much more joyful motivation in doing what we are told. Now that we know on a very deep personal level why I am motivated to be submissive. God has a government in place because that is His desire. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in place. Okay, just notice what He just said there a government in place, and he means this from all time of Christianity, from, from when the Bible was compiled or the New, the New Testament that the Christians follow was compiled till now. And, and John MacArthur said the same thing. This applies. So this means that every evil totalitarian government was put in place by God whether it's the commies, the Nazis, the North Koreans, whether it's China or any other oppressive government, God put them, according to these Christians, God put them in power. Just think of, just dwell on that for a minute. Just think about what that shows about your God. Because Christians always say, well, evil exists because of free will. But then at the same time, you're saying God put these, well, is that, was that men's free will? That, that an evil government was put in place. No, Romans 13 and what Todd is testifying here and what John MacArthur is testifying to is that God put them in power. So you can't say that was men's free will to be governed by evil despots. It was God's desire. So what does that say about God? Voila, he's an evil monster. And if you argue with me and say, no, no, God is good, he's loving, well, why is it that God took away the free will of all the people that, that were forced to live under evil dictators, despots, murderous regimes. He took away their free will because nobody would choose that. that. That wasn't their will. Most of these governments weren't put into place. Now, some were, but most of them weren't put into place by the majority Democratic vote and everybody was happy that, that this evil guy was in power. So God didn't give those people free will, and God specifically wanted this monstrous, murderous dictator in power. Now explain to me how a good, loving father would do that to his children. And if you can't do that, then there you go. The only logical, loving, kind, human thing to do is to leave Christianity and denounce these horrible, evil doctrines. And when they command us to do something, as long as it's not commanding us to sin or keeping us from obeying a command, and I'm not talking about the jab, when we go about the business of obeying, when we drive the speed limit, when we buckle up, when we put fire exit signs above our egress, when we paint the lines in the parking lot at the width that the government says we're actually worshiping God, that should give us a little, ah, <sighs> Are you freaking kidding me? That this is his takeaway from Romans 13 that Christians should be joyful putting up an exit sign or painting the parking lot lines to government specs. And this guy has a lot of followers and this guy is I'm assuming a respected Christian teacher, I'm assuming. He's got a nice studio. 
He doesn't sound like he's completely brain damaged, but what he just said is insanity. If if you're a Christian and you want to know how to deal with Romans 13, and that's your answer, be joyful because the guy painting the stripes in the parking lot is following government regulations. Praise Jesus. The problems, the the the. F- Six trillion four hundred and ninety two billion six hundred and forty seven million and some change of of issues that this guy just glossed over or passed over to talk about painting stripes in a parking lot. That's the heart of the issue. When the government calls you to go to war, when should you say no? When the government calls you to return a runaway, when should you say no? Is it if it's a runaway um, child who's been abused? If it's a a foreign national that's in America illegally? If it's a slave? If you're a Christian back in the you know the 17th or 18th century? The, the early 19th century and you have runaway slaves and how do you decide that? Issues of self-defense, voting on what to force your neighbor to do or not do. Those are the issues. And of course, talking about painting parking lots, you know, that just, it, 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 it's hard to imagine that, that he would even waste his breath with something like that. And the hard things, of course, many of them are hard, are very hard to answer. Some of them are easy, right? So if your government is calling you into a war that is obviously unjust, like let's go invade Canada next week, you might say no to that, right? But that's not how wars happen, is it? Wars don't happen like that. Wars happen like they did in Vietnam. Wars happen like they did in Iraq. And again, I'm not giving political commentary here. There may be some valid reasons or some total lie, horrible reasons why America went into any war that America entered. These are complex issues. My point is, how do you know from Romans 13 when you should put on the uniform and go to war? And again, if you're a young a man being conscripted into the German military in the in the late 30s or the or the 40s whenever when, whenever they started conscripting young soldiers or maybe they didn't have to conscript it and maybe everybody just volunteered because praise Jesus we're painting lines in a parking lot to government specs come on be real these issues are not simplistic but that is a uh, proof of why Romans 13 could not have come from a loving God. It could come from men, especially a man, Paul, who thought the world was about to end, so it didn't matter. He didn't have to address slavery or women's rights or how to take care of the poor long term. He didn't have to address those issues because Jesus was going to return in like a week or two, maybe a year, very quickly. But once you realize that Jesus is not coming back, and these questions are difficult questions, you can't just look at Romans 13 and go, oh, follow what the government says because God put them in place. Really? Do you say that if you're in North Korea or China? Now, this is a controversial subject, not because God's word isn't clear. What the? But I hope to bring some clarity to what the Bible teaches about the subject. The church and the state have different roles, and as Christians, we have a duty to both. Now, remember when they tried to trap Jesus to pay to whether he, we should pay taxes to Caesar or not? They came to him with a loaded or trick question. They said, is it okay to pay taxes to Caesar? The Jews were under the iron heel of Rome, and they were paying tribute to the Roman government. Jesus said, show me a coin. And then he held it up, and he says, whose picture's on this? Now, they said Caesar's. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render to Caesar. We have a responsibility to the government. He didn't say, no, rebel, no, revolt, no, don't pay taxes. 
Now tell me, Christian friend, whose picture is on this coin? Well, it's George the Third. I realize he was he was already passed <clears throat> when King George and George Washington and the and the the rebellious American colonists followed the treacherous, the traitor George Washington, who was defying the king who God had installed in power, if you're a Christian. And instead of rendering to, you know, the, the rightful God-installed government, if Christianity is true and Romans 13 is true, the early American colonists and George Washington, etc., were in complete violation of Christian doctrine and godly teaching. Because why? Well, they were under the authority of a government, according to Christians, that was installed by God. Just look at the coinage and, and take Jesus' parable. Render to Caesar what Caesar's? Well, you should be rendering and paying taxes and following the rules under King George and, and British rule. I mean, this, this is self-evident. My point here is that Christians just make shit up and do what they want anyways. So how many Christians have you ever heard saying, well, we, you know, we're here now, so we got to, you know, there's, we can't unwind the past. But it really is, it, re, it really was a sin that uh, the American Revolution was really a sin. Now, there are some Christians who do point that out. I, I want to be fair here. Um, my, but, but my point stands. Christians just do what they want, and then they justify it however they justify it. So at the, en at the end of the day, what that proves is Christians, Christians at least secretly agree with me pretty much wholeheartedly, but they still give lip service to Romans 13 because why? Well, because once they admit that Romans 13 is just complete bullshit, then they have to start unwinding what else did Paul write that's complete bullshit. And Christians don't want to do that because that's scary because then that means that their faith is based on lies and things that are evil. So it's better for them to sort of twist and change it and, you know, come up with ways to, to explain it all. Now, listen to these next clips. And just in your mind, as you're listening to these next few clips, think about the hypocrisy that's going on. Think about how these, these men in the colonies who owned slaves and talked about freedom and rebelled against the rightful king and, and but talk but you know talk about doing God's work and God's will and following and think about modern Christians who then who then justify the past. I mean there's still Christians that just that try to justify Vietnam. And that should tell you everything you know about Christianity. It, it's like putting a, a drill into your brain and like scrambling part of your brains. Because you have to be dishonest or, or you have to have been self-deluded in order to say and believe these things. Because they're ridiculous if, you're just, if you just step back and objectively look at them without your emotion and without your childhood, I love Jesus, and so forth, you'll realize it's just insanity. There's a better way. Boston, 1773, was the spark that lit the torch of liberty. This is bigger than us, Sam. This is liberty or death. Esta proclama es patria o muerte. Is life so dear or peace? so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery 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 forbid it almighty god i know not what course others may take but as for me give me liberty oh give me death esta proclama es patria o muerte now this is one of my reasons for rejecting christianity even if it was true as reported by christians just read luke 1927 
Jesus is a totalitarian dictator who says, bring those that won't worship me and bow to me and slaughter them in front of me. Just read the text yourself. It's very plain. Jesus wants to murder those that don't bow to his rule. Now, a good person and a loving person who has a good plan for, say, their children, well, of course, would want their children to listen. And, you know, uh, good parents want their kids to listen to them when they give them instructions like don't play in the freeway, don't handle rattlesnakes, don't drink poison, you know, brush your teeth, get a good night's sleep, do your homework. But that, but that's different. That's different than making a, a puppet slave. Because people that make puppet slaves like God, Jehovah, and Jesus, the, the, that's not loving. There's no love there. That, that, that is, that's totalitarianism. It's, it's, it's evil. So when, go, so going back to Patrick Henry's quotes here, give me liberty or give me death, he says, while he owns slaves. Now, in a cursory study, it, it, it appears he was against slavery and wanted to stop the Atlanta slave trade. Now, this did happen in American history in the first decade of the 19th century. So, you know, whatever, whatever that is, some 30 plus years um, after the, the American um, revolution is successful and the, the colonies form states and they form a union and they follow British law um, themselves. So the Brits outlaw the Atlantic slave trade roughly 1802, 1803. The, the Americans follow it in, in that decade. I think by 18, 1808 or so, they've outlawed the Atlantic slave trade. But in, but in a sick irony, what happens? Well, the, the price and the value of young, fertile, enslaved women goes up because now they're more valuable. And, and these fertile, enslaved young women are now put into service to create more slaves. So it didn't really solve the problem. Now, of course, it's good that the Atlantic slave trade ended because that was just a horrific practice, but so is slavery. And so is, and so is essentially breeding humans to make more slaves. That's horrific too. And that was the outcome of banning the Atlantic slave trade is that more, more young women were put into the service of creating more slaves for their masters. Because guess what? If a woman who was an enslaved person had a child, that child did not belong to her. It belonged to the master, and the master could sell that child at, and or work it. Uh, it the, the, it's just insanity. It's insanity that Christians defended this, that Christians enacted these things into law. That was Christianity did that. Like America wasn't an atheist nation and in, you know, 1780, there weren't a lot of atheists running around. There certainly weren't a lot of atheists in Congress. There's not even that today. So who did this? Christians. And what did they justify it on? The Bible. And what did Romans 13 tell, tell the people that were enslaved? Government, it's been installed by God, and you are commanded to follow it. It's disgusting. The Christian religion is a disgusting religion. It's evil. And it's obvious. It's self-evident. The entire, the entire American narrative. Now, I'm not saying everything about America is bad. I don't, I don't hate America if that means the American people. Like I think American people are good and bad, just like everybody else. But the the American ideal that, oh, we're so great. We're so amazing, and we're the best. Like, this is just a fantasy. It's, it's just a fantasy. And the idea, you know, Christians want to always say, oh, we were built on Christian values. We were, we were a Christian nation back then. Wouldn't it be great to go back then? Because it's so horrible today where all the gays are taking over. I don't know. Is it, are, tell me, Christians, are there, are, there any, are there any gay activists or gay congressmen advocating for slavery? I think pretty much we can be clear. Every single congressman and representative and legislator and judge and executive who was part of making and making the American colonies and the American states slave states and slave 
in slave owning colonies. Now, of course, there were some rules and there were some people that fought against it, but by and large, those people instituted the institution of slavery based on Christian values and Christian teaching in the Bible. Now, I know Christians like to say, oh, yes, but it was Christians who stopped slavery. Yeah, okay, so you had a few, you had a few people like Wilberforce. And now remember, Wilberforce is in a small minority, and eventually he wins over British Parliament. But it was a fight. It wasn't like he just said, oh, hey, I've re I read the Bible, guys, and we've, we've been wrong for, you know, 1,800 years. No, I mean, originally he was fought against, like, no, this is, this is, this is God-ordained. And eventually, of course, uh, you know, slavery ends in, in, Brit the, in the British Empire and, and eventually in the Americas. And eventually, you know, the, the people now recognize who are Christians. Oh, slavery is bad. Whoa. Well, gee, tell us something we don't know, Christians. That, but, and that's not even the point. The point is your religion taught that slavery was good and your religion used the government to enforce rules for slaves such as returning runaway slaves to their masters. Now, did you ever imagine why, like, on a plantation, like, the, the the enslaved peoples outnumber the masters by a huge percentage? Why didn't they just revolt and get their freedom and, you know, run, run away or, or, you know, kill their masters and be free? Well, obviously, because the government and the, the population that supported the government through taxes and through voting in judges and and voting in Congress people, they would stomp that down. Those rebellious enslaved peoples would be put to death. And everybody knew that. It was Christians that kept these people enslaved. And if you deny that, you're just a Holocaust denier. You're a flat earther. If you say God and the Bible don't promote slavery and, did, and wasn't the basis for the laws, in the American colonies and in the British Empire, you're, you're just as dumb as somebody saying the earth is flat. You're really that dumb because the you can just read history and read the Bible and you can read what Christian preachers preached. It's obvious what happened. Now, this whole idea of, you know, homeland or death, like I don't get into that kind of stuff. I don't like I don't really care. I understand where people are coming from and I understand people people have this desire for self self rule and self government which i but you know that like that's a good motivation like you want to be in control but ultimately what you know if you control yourself that's amazing but if you give yourself over to the these authorities and powers unlimited as romans 13 says like do what you're told be submissive well this leads this leads to atrocities that's that's just history. There's, there's no way to explain around that. So I love people like George Bush or this guy Pat Robertson as televangelist in the state. These are Christians for stronger nuclear armament. Oh, what a great deal of faith. Because I know if Jesus were here, he'd probably have an Uzi on him. Don't you think he would? Jesus? Yeah, he would. The Prince of Peace is back. I'm talking about the real owners now. The big... Re the wealthy, that, the real owners, the big wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. Forget the politicians. They're, they're, they're irrelevant. The politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. They own you. They own everything. They own all the important land. They own and control the corporations. They've long since bought and paid for the Senate, the Congress, the state houses, the city halls. They got the judges in their back pockets. And they own all the big media, media news, all the big media companies, so they control just about all of the news and information you get to hear. They got you by the balls. Now, you might want to disagree with some of George Carlin's points there. You might think, well, you have some freedoms and you have some, you know, right to self-rule. And, the, and that the rich and the powerful aren't really controlling everything. And that when you go to your job and you work, you know, probably half of your hours go to taxation, which is then filtered through various organizations and ultimately leads to some things that are social good and some things that are very dubious. Like maybe you think you're mostly free. And maybe you want to discount some of what George Carlin is saying there about who, who really has the power. But 
at the end at the end of the day if you live in america and i and i know this for a fact you can take it at anecdotally but it seems pretty much a fact to me because i've experienced it now for going on like 7 years i i live in what's essentially a narco state and i am vastly more free here and much happier than i ever was in in the states if you think you're free in america it's only because you have an experience freedom elsewhere and this isn't a diatribe against america it's just to point out that when you are in a cage and you're used to the cage and you live in the cage it's very easy to think that the cage is freedom the the the, ca the cage is the reality the, that's around you in your mind your mind can't grasp being outside of the cage now, this reminds me of a cs lewis um analogy where he says the the kingdom of heaven to some people is like this little kid playing in a in a mud puddle and, but and he doesn't realize what it means to have a holiday at the beach now of course i don't agree with cs lewis's worldview about heaven and jesus but I, but his analogy is very apt here you can be a child playing in a mud puddle just like that cs lewis very vividly gives a picture of you're a child playing in a mud puddle and it might even be fun and you might even think hey this is great but you don't have a concept of the holiday at the beach so you have no comparison and that's my point my that's my point about what i've learned about freedom and getting out of the cage and getting out of christianity of course was even a bigger one for me the the blinders that you wear in christianity and the cage that you're in won't be apparent to you until and unless you deconstruct from it because you can't know what you can't know it's impossible you unless you've experienced the freedom and it doesn't even have to be atheism it just has to be accepting that this christian god and the and christianity is based on man-made things that that Paul was writing as a man, a flawed man, and a lot of what he wrote was disgusting like slaves, you know, be obedient, you know, go back to your master and sl slaves, you know, work really hard. They you're you're these these things are disgusting. But if if you're a Christian, you you filter that through, oh well there must be an explanation. Maybe I don't understand it when I'm in heaven, I'll understand it. Why don't you try to understand it now because if you do that it might lead to freedom. And maybe you still maybe you remain a Christian and you remain in church but you become free thinking and you think for yourself and you realize you can throw off things that are destructive to hum, to humanity and and more importantly in my point here destructive to yourself because if everybody on the planet put their own self-care first and this is this is so, I believe this so strongly. Take care of yourself first. Take care of your mental health. Take care of your your life around yourself and put yourself first. And that may sound like a selfish thing, but the reality is I can't love my girlfriend. I can't take care of even our dogs. I can't take care of my, you know my kids are adults but i can't be loving and kind to them if i'm not taking care of myself if i'm not healthy if i'm not the best me then i can't be the best to them whether it's boyfriend father um just friend or a member of the community that that does good like i live in a community where i i i want the community to be better like i try to shop locally i try to support the local people in my neighborhood i i'm I don't do things that cause harm to others as much as possible. And if everybody had that mindset on the planet, voila. We we don't live in paradise, but we live in a much better world. So, let me leave you let me leave you with a final Bill Hicks quote. I'll let him speak for me. Thank you for watching. This has been Michael Beverly. Please like, subscribe and share. If you appreciate my content and you want to support me, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I did that joke in Alabama. These three rednecks met me after the show. Hey, buddy, come here. Mr. Funny Man, come here. 
Hey, buddy, we're Christians. We don't like what you said. I said, then forgive me. <laughs>